Yeah. Alright. Oh, yeah, Alright guys, how's everyone doing this evening? So this ought to be an exciting one. Um, we've got uh, some hardware that we've been playing with, a uh, little bit of uh, um, software as well. Uh, I'm going to let Todd and, and Ken go into more detail on that. Uh, but this ought to be fun. It's going to be really interactive and you can see a lot of what we play with here in uh, cloud space. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I know these guys want to get moving, but uh, thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. As always, we always look for presenters, so we'll encourage, I know there's a bunch of you guys have already presented, so um, yeah, we like repeats as well. Uh, <laughs> suggestions, all that stuff. Caitlin will go, was anybody here last week? Okay, as you guys know, I totally flubbed last week because <laughs> Caitlin was on vacation, so we're glad that she's back. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin and uh, look forward to seeing what these guys are going to present. Okay, so real yeah. quick, we do have the Orlando Tech Meetup on Thursday. I think I still need volunteers, so if you guys want to help out, let me know. Hint, hint. I hate you. So we have that, and also, too, Friday we brought back the, I won't be there, sadly, but we brought back the Orlando Tech Pub Crawl. So there's that going on again, finally. Uh, that'll be another, that's always going to be the Friday of every month in random places. And then, let's see. Yeah, I'm not allowed to ever take a Tuesday off ever again after last week. So you guys you mostly see my face. What else? Oh, that's right. How did I miss so, all of this? So. Huh? I, I obviously missed all of this. Oh, this was, it was just, I was texting him while sitting, just getting home, going, what happened? Yeah, <laughs> the, the audio didn't go last week. We had a problem with the audio. So I'm texting him, going, where's the audio? I can't see the slides. <laughs> He's like, I thought you were driving. I was like, I just got home. That's better than feedbacking your own audio. <laughs> hey, I know I somebody who's do done. Oh, yeah, that's you. You were arguing with it. Yeah, I argued with myself and trolled my own meetup. It was great. So for those who were there, it was really entertaining. For those who watched it later, it's still really entertaining. <laughs> um, we also decided, and we finally got it going, we're doing Google I.O. Yay. Woohoo! Yeah. So it's going to be, there's a Facebook group thing to RSVP to it. I'll post it through the Android group tomorrow. But it's next Thursday? No, it's 28. <laughs> You're the main organizer of this. It's close enough. <laughs> it's the 28th. Not next week. But yeah. Week. Okay, yeah. So it's the 28th. It's going to be from 12 to 8. And so we'll be doing the Google Live show. Also, what? Next Thursday. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. Next Thursday. And there's free food. Yeah, so there'll be free food. Do the Google Live stream. And we are looking for keynote speakers as well on anything Google. Caitlin's going to do talk. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> So that's all happening over at UCF, and the Facebook group will have the room number and all the details along that as well. So I'll make sure I post all that. But all right, let's get this party started. That's good. So this is Todd and Ken, hey. and I'll let you guys right. introduce yourselves from there. All right. So uh, yeah. So um, hey, I'm Todd, uh, one of the founders here at CloudSpace, um, and this is Ken. You all things Android extraordinaire. I don't know. What else do you want to yeah, say? Yeah, uh, generally, I, I came on as an Android guy. Um, we've kind of switched to a pretty much uh, anything fun guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this this position here quite a lot. It's been pretty nice. Yeah, so, uh, so it's uh, one of the best things about uh, working at a company like this is uh, when you're between projects or you have a few hours, a uh, little bit there, you know, you get to kind of work on crazy shit. And it's, uh, it's great, right? So uh, I like robots and uh, had worked on open sourcing some uh, software with the robotic operating system in Android uh, about three years ago, back uh, when it was really, really, really hard to do. A um, bunch of uh, bitwise shifting and stuff. It's uh, come a long way since then. Um, if anybody, is everybody familiar with the robotic operating system or if any of you guys used it or? No. All right. Cool. So we get to talk about a, a bunch of really interesting stuff. So um, <coughs> robotic operating system is a platform that runs a lot of the most 
the biggest robots in the world. Um, next month, uh, the 5th and the 6th, I think it is, DARPA has their big robotics challenge coming up where they're testing all the different humanoid robots. May I'm driving cars. They haven't actually announced all the challenges. Or, but they're actually taking humanoid robots. Most of them are running the robotic operating system. The, the uh, space astronaut robot is running the robotic operating system. And it's all open source. Uh, it was started at a company, Willow Garage. It's now the uh, open source uh, foundation, federation, something like that, uh, is running it along with Google and a bunch of other people contributing code. And just like uh, Android, they uh, take a lot of, they want people from the outside to contribute. And what we've been working on is a, or Ken, I should say, has been working on, is a uh, this, this bridge to bring the robotic uh, operating system to uh, Android and Arduino to make all the pieces kind of work together and a bunch of libraries around that. Um, so really quick, I'm going to talk about uh, this beast, which I uh, built in the last uh, five days, actually, this little guy. Um, just talk a little bit about how the hardware works, and then I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ken to talk about how all the software and everything works under the hood. So. Um, Literally, this is the third rev. The first one was built Wednesday. The uh, second one was built Friday. And then yesterday, I finally got this working kind of end to end. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys have seen other telepresence robots out there. Uh, that's the idea is we're going to have this around the office for letting our guys in Boulder and everywhere come around and mostly harass Caitlin. Um, but what's that? Oh yeah, eventually we'll you know give it hands. It'll be really obnoxious. Um, but uh, this guy built the most expensive piece on there is a motor driver, which is way overpowered. It was like 125 bucks. Yeah, it's. But other than that, it uses an Arduino uh, 80k mega, and I actually left the. Uh, can you hold that for a second? I'm gonna yeah. just lift it up. Sure. So, if you look at the uh, under the hood here, literally, um, this is an Arduino 80k. This is the version of the Arduino that interfaces with uh, the Android, basically out of the box. This came out at Google I.O. actually three years ago? Yeah, I was thinking three. Three issues. Three or four. Yeah, the first one looked like this big, they let you build a big clock, and then they came out with the uh, smaller open source version shortly after. That's the uh, motor driver. These are actually two Harbor Freight <coughs> drills. And uh, you can take the drill motors out, and uh, you can you basically have to do a little work under the hood here to uh, to uh, tweak the uh, orbital gears. But you can get them for about 16 bucks, and they come with a battery and a battery charger. And you can actually mod. I decided I'd mod the second battery charger since I had to buy two of them to actually be my power source for the bot. So 30 bucks, you've got a full drivetrain with power that you can plop, switch these in and out. So. Super cost effective. Um, and then just a standard Nexus tablet. Uh, 3D printed a couple of brackets here to hold it last night. And uh, that's basically the bot. You can also see the first platform we started working on over here. Um, yeah, so pan tilt on a, uh, on a telephone, on a uh, phone, uh, basically case mount. And then we uh, used to have a shop bot and use that to cut some mounting brackets for servos and various other things. Um, so this guy will be walking and wandering around the office, probably a little swarm of them after we do a few more iterations. Um, this one's just uh, pretty damn cool. You can do all yeah. sorts of fun stuff with it. Uh, the plan is after we do the talk here, there'll be a second talk and then hopefully during at the end of the second talk, we can let you guys actually come and play with this with uh, Google, I don't know if you guys have all played with cardboard. You probably have, being uh, uh, Android guys. And uh, you'll be able to see we actually have it driving around with the stereoscopic vision, which you can drive around under tables and stuff. It's pretty damn cool. So um, so that's kind of the little overview of the hardware. That runs the exact same way with a, an uh, 80K Mega. And why don't you take it away and talk software? All right. So, all right. This is the longer one. Yeah, the longer one. All right, so the project is called Ardrobot, and it's uh, an entire open source robotics platform. It's not an actual, it's not just one bot. As you see, we have this guy, which is just to cruise around and do whatever. This is running the exact same code um, as this one with one modification to the drivetrain. Uh, we actually have a list of drivetrains. 
um, as according to a robotics author. I can't remember the name. We can put some links up afterwards, though. Uh, and he has a list of 11 types of drivetrains for, uh, for robots. One of them is the independent steering for the front wheels with the uh, speed, the forward and backwards motion coming from the rear wheels. That's, uh, I believe, drivetrain type six. Uh, type two is what we're dealing with here, which is a left wheel and a right wheel mounted towards the back with casters on the front to even out the weight. Eventually, what would be really cool is if we, is, and what we want to do um, is shift those wheels up a little bit to get them in the, m in the middle, remove the casters and kind of have it like the Segway where it, uh, it's kind of free floating. Um, that's a little bit more than a little bit more down the ways, uh, uh, but I it's definitely coming, coming through. Tuesday, so <coughs> I did three iterations in uh, five days <laughs> of hardware. Yeah. And uh, quick shout out to my wife who actually built everything. I did the 3D modeling stuff, and she's an awesome hardware side. Yeah. yeah, so I actually got my hands on yeah. this bot today, um, this morning. So this, this it does a little bit less than what I was hoping to have it do um, for you guys today, but this guy is fully fledged and is absolutely awesome. That guy's my baby. Um, so the project goals um, was to have everything open source. We're working off of open source projects. We're contributing everything that we can back to these open source projects um, and trying to get the word out and trying to get other people interested in, in ROS and all the cool things that you can do with it. Um, we wanted it to, to be modular. Um, so. If you guys were here for the last meetup, I went into how ROS works with uh, all the modules. Um, basically, ROS is ROS a pub sub uh, setup. You publish and you subscribe to a channel that contains data. Um, each channel is called a node. Uh, for Android, you basically get this thing called an abstract node. And what you're given is a connection to the ROS server. Uh, and with that channel, you can pretty much provide any kind of data in, in any type that you want. Um, and those are where the modules come in. So for this project, I wrote a module for voice communication. Um, and that actually will allow us to speak kind of walkie-talkie style um, from the controller and to the robot. Uh, I also wrote some video communication stuff. Um, and uh, what I would like to see are other things like uh, temperature, uh, temperature data, uh, maybe weather, barometer, whatever. Um, basically, any kind of data that you package and send along a byte stream um, works perfectly fine as a module. Um, and by everything. So as he said, we 3D printed and shot botted almost everything. Uh, it's <laughs> kind of sad, but we actually set one of the uh, 3D printers on fire um, <laughs> when we first started working. So I actually have a, uh, a fire extinguisher in that back office with me at all times, just in case now. Um, the, the, and the, the first one of these, the, uh, the Rev Zero, actually has a nice burn mark on it, too. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that's why we have the beefy motor driver now. You yes. The Don't mess around anymore. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, we wanted video communication, audio communication, and this last one, VR integration, uh, was kind of a really cool one. Um, so last year, I went to I.O., and I fell in love with cardboard. But unfortunately, I haven't really had a use for cardboard. Um, it's still you know, kind of just a, a fun little project on the side. But with this, we were like, oh my god, the coolest thing in the world would be you know, a, a first-person view of this robot as you're driving around. And it was surprisingly easy. So I wrote a module for it. And uh, there's actually a ROS cardboard module that takes a uh, a video stream and converts it to the stereoscopic view um, for cardboard and spits it out into, into that. Um, you guys will actually be able to see and play with that later, hopefully. Um, so some of the project issues, uh, <laughs> some of the many, many, many project issues that we dealt with um, were outdated software. Um, so since we're working off of open source everything, um, you know, that's at the whim of the, the contributors to update all these things. Um, so for example, our ROS serial that we wrote, um, that's the actual communication between the Arduino and the internet connected phone device. So with ROS, ROS needs an internet connection to actually do anything. An Arduino, most of them at least, don't have any type of network connect, uh, connectivity. Um, so what you actually have to do is basically pass all of that data through the byte stream and then uh, deal with it on either end. There's actually a, there's a ROS protocol that specifies how all that works. And I had to write all of that, or rewrite all of that for four versions of ROS ahead of where it was currently set to. Um, so this was like four years old um, that I had to rewrite almost from scratch. Uh, less than optimal behavior of the libraries. Um, uh, we're dealing with this library called uh, USB host. Um, and it's communication between the Arduino board and the phone. 
Uh, and that actually it works really well when you get it, everything configured right, but it's like a, a stack of cards. One thing goes wrong, and then it all just collapses. And uh, we've had many, many, many issues with that one specifically. Um, tons of new technologies, uh, new languages. Um, this all stuff that nobody has really either hasn't really done before or hasn't really documented or whatever the case may be. So we're kind of the, the first out there. So there's, you can't really just go on a Stack Overflow and be like, hey, how do I do this? Uh, because nobody's really done it before. Um, so it's really cool, but it's also been definitely a uh, kind, not really an issue, but a, 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 sl a slowdown for us. Um, and then hardware failures. So we've had the 3D printer catch on fire. We had at least four Mega 80K Arduinos die. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty high rate of failure for a project like this. Uh, but they are still kind of volatile, uh, volatile, volatile boards. They may not um, be dead yet. We, we have yes. Confirmed. Yeah, we might be able to save them. But as of now, they are dead. And you can't write to them. Basically, the bootloader gets corrupted. Um, and you can't write anything new to it. So anything that's on it currently is good to go. Uh, but if you want to add anything new, you're out of luck. Um, so hopefully we're going to be able. We're actually going to try that later today or tomorrow. Um, so wish us luck there. But otherwise, <laughs> always keep lots and lots and lots of Arduinos on hand. Um, so some of the tech technologies that we used we used Arduino, obviously, um, Intel Edison. Uh, that's another Arduino-like board that uh, that runs a full Linux distribution. I believe it's Yocto, um, and it runs. Uh, it's it's really awesome. Don't remember all the uh, specs, Todd. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a really powerful board, uh, really cost effective. It's it's quite a bit more expensive than a um, like a Raspberry Pi, um, but the the beauty of it and what it's designed for is it's really small form factor and it's designed for Internet of Things. It's designed to run on very very minimal power for getting a full uh, uh, Linux kernel, which you can actually put anything on there. Yeah. yeah. By default. Yeah. Um, and then it also has a bridge to be able to use native uh, Android, I mean, sorry, Arduino uh, shields. So you yeah. can actually have your use all those capabilities <coughs> and it has a bridge there written into the software. Yeah, so you can actually write s Arduino sketches for the Edison and have them run alongside the core Linux OS doing, you know, whatever C plus program or, you know, whatever you have running on there. Um, you do, that was kind of a, uh, that distribution that allows that, there's a special process that runs for the Arduino uh, to actually allow those Arduino sketches to run. That process wasn't available on some of the other um, more full-fledged distributions of Linux, which is what we were looking into. Um, that was one of the reasons we didn't go down that route, because we were looking for a very quick spin-up time, and I didn't want to go through and you know find out what makes this Arduino process run. Um, but as he mentioned, it also uh, has the headers installed for all of the Arduino shields. So if you have a really cool shield, such as this uh, USB host shield um, that we had, that will actually work on Arduinos and the Edison. So you can take that whole sketch that you had on Edis or on your Arduino, take that everything you had, swap it over to the Edison, and then have the full internet connectivity of the uh, Linux OS, the full Bluetooth stack, you know, everything you, you could imagine. Um, we also used the Google Cardboard. Uh, SCAD is a programmatic uh, CAD language, which was very interesting and uh, very, very difficult. Um. Yeah, no, well, no, no. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, um, well, if you haven't seen uh, Open SCAD, it's a, an open source, uh, completely free. Let me see if uh, I can. What was that? I'm going to actually see if yeah, I can pull it, up. pull it up. So it's a, an open source, it's basically a programmer's uh, 3D modeling tool, right? So everything you write is code. There's no visual interface to edit the models. Um, it does a great job. It's really, it, it builds uh, meshes, uh, like STL files for 3D printing. Um, so, uh, but it's really powerful. Um, unfortunately, it's not compatible uh, at the end of the day with AutoCAD. Uh, I've been modeling this guy in a um, combination of AutoCAD Fusion 360, where I'd have to bring in flat DXF files and then extrude them. And do all that kind of craziness, don't, don't and then, fusion. what's that? Don't do fusion, it's okay. Eh, it's, it's, it's actually all right, but um, so, uh, so I've been using that, and then the shop bot itself has a couple of tools for VCAR for actually doing carving paths, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a CNC machine that can do um, custom circuit boards, as well as anything up to 24 by 
18 of aluminum, or like basically that's where we cut the rest of the parts of this. Yeah, so a quick uh, intro into what SCAD is. If you look over here, basically uh, with SCAD, you have additions and subtractions of shapes, and you're given uh, cylinders, linear, flat, uh, flat surfaces, and circles. And from that, you have to combine or subtract those shapes to create whatever you need. Um, so the demo that I saw was to how to build the, uh, the bishop chess piece, and it blew my mind. I, was, I had a headache by the end of it. It was, way, it was very, very intense. Um, as you see, it's a lot of metaprogramming because all, again, you can do in, at the end of the day is subtract and add shapes. Yeah. Um, so, so you can actually do a lot with it. You can build modules and sub-module mm -hmm. them. And, uh, yeah, back when I was doing yeah, this module heavily, screw like hole. three years ago when I first got the 3D printing, it's, yeah, I actually had big interactive pieces. You can do a lot with it. It looks kind of intimidating, but once you get the syntax down, it's very, very powerful. It's incredibly powerful, too. Yeah, there's uh, some it, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, it, it was just uh, a lot to jump into very quickly. Yeah. But again, that's only for 3D printing for the most part. Yes. It, do meshes. it can't do solid object modeling that you need. Um, and then for 3D printing. Uh, so Todd and his wife actually build and make 3D printers. Um, so we had, a, uh, we had his wife in here, Liz, doing all kinds of crazy stuff with our 3D printer. And yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, Without yeah, her, we wouldn't have done it. And yeah. And it all up in like two hours. Multiple times. Fixed it multiple times. Um, so some of the features that we have currently in place, um, we have video, um, but as of this moment, it's only one way. So you can see from the controller, what the car is seeing. Eventually, we would like to swap that and make that configurable so that as this guy is rolling around, um, sorry, as this guy is rolling around, uh, the person controlling it, his face shows up right here and he can talk to whoever's looking around. Um, so this one was more of like a, an exploratory style bot and this was our original style. Um, so you could just drive it around and see what was going on. This one's going to be kind of like our, uh, uh, our person bot. So the needs are a little bit different. But again, because it's modular, it's very easy to just change around what we're going to do. Um, ooh. So yeah, uh, the video streaming drive using the camera mounted on the car. Uh, we have a heads up view, and then that way, even if the car is you know, outside in another room, you can still drive it around. I used to sit in the office and then see if I could drive it around and make the office like a little obstacle course using just the camera. Scream. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, screaming bring us into uh, the two, oh man. Uh, bring us into the two-way audio streaming. Um, so we actually have like a, a walkie-talkie walkie style setup um, that will allow for uh, simultaneous audio incoming and outgoing, depending on you know if you have a headset on or whatever the case may be. Um, it also uses some of the echo cancellation, some of the other noise filters and all that that Android supplies, um, which unfortunately, most of those aren't available on tablets because they weren't meant to take phone calls. Uh, so from a phone to a tablet, that connection has a bit of an echo and it's a little it's not as clean as I would like. Um, but if you have a phone as the bot brain, um, the, the connection is like call quality. It's amazing. Um, so we also have a joystick style controller. So you have, uh, you'll hopefully be able to see that as well. Um, it has a, uh, it's a full screen view of what the bot is seeing with the joystick down in the bottom right corner. And you just kind of, cruise around doing that. Um, and we also have a tilt-based controller. So it's the full video screen again. And when you touch down on the screen, that starts sending your IMU data, which is your inertial measurement unit data. Uh, so it's basically your position in 3D space. Um, it will send all of that information over ROS through a IMU module that I wrote um, down to the bot which then will send it forward or backwards or turn it as, as needed. So basically, you touch down on the screen and you turn or tilt forward or whatever to drive it. It's uh, one of the more fun ones. Um, so the proposed coming soon features. So we already have the VR viewer. Um, but on this one, we have this little pan tilt module, which will allow us to look around um, using the data that's coming back from the phone as it's sitting in the cardboard mount. So as you're sitting, as you have be able to look left and the robot will look left and you'll be able to see what's over there independently of where it's driving. So you can drive it forward and look to your right or to your, or yeah, to your right <laughs> or left um, and uh, be able to see what's going on. 
um, location mapping. So this is stuff a little bit further down the road, but this is going to be some really, really awesome stuff. And we have just talking today about uh, some charging ideas using this, which is blew my mind. It's super awesome. Um, so the occipital sensor structure or structure sensor uh, is probably not something that we're still looking into unless we switch to, to Edison. Um, but it was really cool. Uh, it used a lot of open source technologies on the back end to do. The, the Android stuff is coming out for that. It was just iOS, but the Android stuff's coming out. OK, so cool. Yeah, we will be able to use that. Um, it's kind of like a really small connect that lets you do. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I should have mentioned about ROS, the reason we went down the ROS path is all these advanced robots are using this, and there are literally hundreds of modules that are out there. And once you get the basics working, you take you can take advantage of all this. So there's a thing mm -hmm. called simultaneous looking. Uh, That's slam. Slam. Yes, yeah, simultaneous location and mapping, where you can actually generate a 3D model of the room and know exactly where you are and drive around, and it'll start to learn its position. And um, yeah, so you can actually take advantage of all of those modules once you get it done. And so yeah, you get a any of these sensors hooked up, like we're talking about the Pixie or the Accidental, yeah, you get almost all of that for free once you get the drive. Yeah. So his idea for uh, the, the charging that would be so awesome, um, using one of these Pixie, Pixie cameras or one of the other ones that does slam and does object recognition, uh, as the battery for the robot detects, you know, hey, I, ne I need to be charged, I have to stop doing whatever I'm doing, it could look around the room, find an outlet, and then use some type of you know, actuator to, to move its plug to how, whatever height that it needs to be, and then just back up right in and plug itself into a wall. So like uh, the Roombas have the little base that it just goes back into and you know, sits, but this wouldn't even need a base. This could, anywhere it was at, it could look and find an outlet and charge itself in as needed. Um, and that's just one of the things that you can do with location mapping. It's amazing, amazing technology. Um, and then object detection, so for very uh, um, much more simple object detection, you can use LiDAR and RADAR uh, depending on your outsider indoor conditions. Um, so revision two is our office spot. Head height, um, we're going to add more speakers, better speakers. Uh, we have this 12 volt battery, which is going to be awesome. Um, and then we also, we already have this mostly in, um, the control over VPN, but we need to expose our VPN um, and do a little bit more stuff on the networking side, uh, but that's not really uh, too high of a priority at this current time. But yeah, this will let our people that are in Boulder and New York and yeah, San Francisco all come and join up to the table and drive around the office and hang out. And <laughs> yeah, so you could just sign in to like a, a web portal um, or open the app and sign in with like a username or something like that. And anywhere where you are, as long as the bot has an internet connection and you have an internet connection, you guys can uh, communicate and talk. Um, oh, and I was just going to say, so, so that's, you know, kind of the first rev. What I would love to have someday is, uh, you know, I think all the stuff with VR and we've got an Oculus and all that kind of stuff is, is awesome. but. I would much rather just have kind of shifted reality where I have an hour, I would love to go cruise around the plaza in Italy during my lunch break. You know, just throw on the headset and go cruise around with one of these guys. Actually, what's happening Virtual right tourism. Now. Yeah, virtual tour tourism would be so amazing if you could do it you know, real time. And you could have something like a, a little kiosk, like, you know, in the plaza somewhere and then have, a, you know, like 20 of these little robots that you can yeah. rent access to. Yeah. And the, like the, the footprint of a stall or a stand like that is going to be very, very small compared to actually traveling to wherever you're doing. And the experience is going to be much more immersive because you're actually driving around. You're not on a set path. You're not using Google, uh, what is it, the street view to just you know see pictures of what it is. And it's all real time. So you can see construction going up, things changing, you know, the people that are there, whatever it, Likewise, it is. Likewise, if you got a dozen of these and that, uh, a dozen of the, these, uh, like the car version, or I've got an Iris, also the open ROV underwater version, and I've got the um, quadcopter. 21st century robot, the humanoid robot. We've got one of those that hasn't been built yet, but we've got it. Um, oh, it came in? Yeah, it came in. Um, <laughs> and uh, can you imagine like just racing with eight of your friends, you know, on with the with the cruisers all in VR, just actually, especially if you have got kids, you know, I can let them go head to head. They would just lose their minds as opposed to play the video game. They're actually cruising out, you know, not like the little Omni drives, but out on a big dirt track with a bunch of these that are, uh, you know, one-tenth scale, it'd be pretty amazing. Yeah. So again, that brings us back to the fact that this is a platform. It's not really individual.
individual product. And for our pra practical applications, um, that's kind of the goal. The practical application is anything that you can really think of, anything that it's applicable to. Um, for ours, ours is obviously this office bot. This, this was the, uh, the platform to kind of just test everything out and figure out what we needed to do, what, like all the technologies involved. And this is kind of our first practical use of this, uh, this technology that we've been working on for months and months and months now. Um, so yeah, that's the presentation. Caitlin, are we <coughs> total, how, have we totally blown time? Or are we no, you're good. Good? You're good. Uh, do you want to show us a little bit of the code really quick for a few minutes? Kind of show sure. like where some of the uh, apps are. Uh, OK. So all this code is up on, uh, as we said, it's open source up on GitHub slash CloudSpace. Um, we've got tons of open source stuff there. Try to dig through. We've been open sourcing a bunch around Docker. Uh, been doing some React Native stuff and the, just tons of other geolocation stuff. Um, but yeah, if you look for the Roz stuff or Arjurbot stuff under that account, you'll find it. So uh, let's see. So another thing that made uh, Roz really great for this project, especially for Android and Android Studio and Gradle, if you guys have switched, hopefully you have. I don't want to see any of you using Eclipse anymore. Uh, you can use actual Gradle modules uh, to build all of the ROS modules. So if you break it down into here, um, I don't think I can. Yeah. Can yeah. Uh, you can't control plus? No, not over here, only on the actual code. Um, so right here, this one is the ROS cardboard. Um, we have one module. No, definitely would not. <laughs> so uh, uh, you have your actual activity. Um, this was a combination of some of the ROS code, open sourced uh, ROS code, and some of the open sourced uh, cardboard code. Um, and basically, what this does is creates a. Uh, where is it? My cardboard message. Oh, this does it in the background. So this extends my card cardboard activity. Um, I'm looking for, and it has a set cardboard view. Um, so basically, every time something comes through, every time it just updates this uh, cardboard view. I'm looking for the actual node. Okay, so this cardboard stereo renderer, uh, this is a beautiful piece of code from Google. Um, this is actually what does not only just the splitting of the view into two, but there's also a lot of there's a little bit of skewing that is involved. Uh, so the lenses that you look through that magnify everything uh, are you know lenses. They're convex. So as you're looking through things, things kind of get skewed, and you actually have to take that into account in all the code. Um, thankfully. We personally don't have to. All of this does. So on this init, this is where all the ROS code happens. Um, let me see if I can zoom you in. Yeah. So this is where all the actual code happens for uh, for ROS. So you have a node configuration, which basically just sets up the information. You know, this is the uh, the master URI. This is my name. Whatever the case is. Um, so we're setting master URI to the default master URI and naming it uh, right I. And then you have your ROS image view. Uh, ROS image view is basically a class that works with the ROS channels to accept whatever is coming through as their image object and pipe it directly into an image view. So basically, I just take two ROS image views and split them using the Google Cardboard code. Um, it's very simple. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to get into the exacts about how, how because the code is a little dry. Uh, but as he said, all of the code for everything that you've seen here, not actually even just the code, uh, but all the models for all of the uh, objects that we had to 3D print, all that is up on GitHub for absolutely everything. Except the ones from last night. I'll get those up. Yeah, maybe not those yet, but they'll be, they'll be up there soon. Um, so yeah, the, the modularity of everything was perfect for this. Uh, it was really the, uh, the best way um, that we could have possibly put this together. Um, so you see we have uh, ROS Serial, ROS Serial Android. Um, there's ROS Serial Java. 
There's Roz Cardboard. There's the Roz Java audio that we wrote. Um, there's Arduino code for all the sketches that we wrote. Even some of the older sketches um, just did like servo control, or uh, we actually had a previous platform that used a brushless motor. Um, and <laughs> I almost broke my, uh, my friend's um, ankle with that one. I took it home to take it down as slow as it could possibly go, and I'm driving it, and they're insane. I'm sure you guys have all seen videos of people getting wiped out by uh, RC cars. And it was one of those RC cars, like stupid fast RC cars, and <laughs> smack, she yeah, face planted. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. also be aware, though, if you do get a rock crawler, they're uh, four wheel drive. So, when I was working with everything before, uh, the first platform, the first car was rear wheel drive, and the front ones were just, you know, whatever, they were floating. So, all I would do is just stack up, I would just lift the rear wheel, the rear wheels while I was developing. So, when they spun it, you know, didn't take off because everything's connected. Um, the servos were all connected to the boards, which connected to my phone, and the computer, and everything. Um, and the first time I start playing with this one, I lift up the rear wheels, and I'm like, okay, everything's fine. And then it goes, and it just boom, everything s flies out. I was like, oh man. And yeah, it, it's a four wheel drive, which was a uh, kind of an eye opener for IC car RC cars. I didn't know they uh, made them that awesome. Um, but yeah, definitely you want to do a very torquey, low speed rock crawler, because um, the speed is definitely not the important thing. What you want is the maneuverability and the controllability. Cool. So, um, Let's one actually last thing. So, again, the uh, DARPA challenge, I highly recommend you guys check that out. Fifth and sixth is next month, which be amazing. Um, Roz, the, uh, they've been working on a thing, uh, they've had it forever called Gazebo that lets you actually model these type of robots and run. Uh, there's that echo. Sorry. No. Um, yeah, I've had kind of sleeping on um, in there, but now that they're wrapping that up, because that's been their primary mission, Dr. was funding them, uh, they're now working on the next version of Roz, and it's all around swarms of robots, and it will be backwards compatible. So if you guys get into this stuff, start playing with the uh, Android side, start building bots, you can you know update quad captures that'll work with anything, and uh, when that next version comes, that's coming out next summer. So um, I think that's about it. Unless you want to show off a little yeah. bit of this, and then we Just can a little uh, bit. definitely show off the uh, that guy. Hopefully afterwards, we'll yeah. So you guys drive around. One of the limitations that we're having with this bot currently is that it needs to be connected to a computer. Um, um, we should mention this was programmed for the first time at 10 a.m. Yeah, yeah, I just got a hold of all of this, this whole setup this morning, um, and it's a very different setup. Uh, we're using different libraries for all of the drive, uh, drive code. Um, we're using different hardware for, for all of the drive code, um, different electrical configurations. It's a very, very incredibly new platform. Um, the fact that the Ardrobot code works with just one, yeah, one modifications um, is you know, a, a testament to the, the platformness of this platform. It, it really, I got to drive that home. It's not a product, it's a platform. Take this, do something cool with it, and make that your product. Yeah, I mean, um, so, so much so that uh, we realized we couldn't actually plug the plug in with the bar all the way down. So yeah. So, echo. Um, so it has to be currently connected to the computer, and it's actually due to some type of electrical issue. Um, it doesn't have enough juice as is without being connected to the computer to trigger uh, the event on the actual tablet and open up the app and get the accessory connection going. We think we figured out why. It's we're running power mm -hmm. into five volts, but we don't have a long enough cable. Yeah. <laughs> if we had one more inch of cable, we could actually power it off the battery. It would be like and, uh, maybe a centimeter. So, so tomorrow, <laughs> yeah, a centimeter more cable, we would be able to uh, actually power it off the battery and it would be completely fine. Yeah. Wireless, at least, yeah. So it's not using the computer for anything other than just uh, something electrical. Um, but let's see if I can very, very gently drive it. So you, and currently we have forward and we also have backwards working. Um, but two caveats even to that. Uh, so as you mentioned, it's using a drill. Um, that means if they're mounted like this, that means that one drill is mounted forward, one drill to go forward is actually spinning backwards as far as the drill is concerned. Um, and drills are more powerful going forward because it's what drills are for. So we, in the code, we actually have to make a modification uh, when we're going forward. We have to overpower the drill that is, going, that is technically backwards. Um, and then when we're going backwards, we have to 
do something else. It, it, the, no, the logic gets really tricky. Yeah, yeah. the logic gets really tricky. Um, but yeah, basically you have to overpower one wheel um, depending on which way you're going just to get it to go straight. And we notice that you know after a while it still starts to curve. We have ideas and ways to fix that. Yeah, but that's a, a little bit further down the road. Um, we also, I also haven't figured out quite how to get a smooth turn yet um, because with this one, the turn is completely independent of anything else. Um, the code that I have right now gives me an angle for a turn. So if I want to go 30 degrees, I know I want to go 30 degrees on the Arduino, and then I just turn those wheels 30 degrees. On this one, because there's no measurements as far as that, that's concerned, really, um, it would just, I guess, be a time-based kind of thing, and it would just be overpowering one wheel to go one way and overpowering the other to go the other. Wait, um, we got this. We yeah, so there, there are ways to do it, but I think if we get the wheel encoder, we can actually take real measurements yep. and actually um, get real angles, and we could use the GuyMU data from the, tab or from the tablet and all that. Um, so there are ways to get that even better, so we can actually go turn you know, 30 degrees this way. And once we shift those wheels to the middle, um, we're going to be using IMU data for pretty much everything anyways, so uh, we'll definitely be able to go specific angles you know, in either direction. But yeah, this one, it's, uh, it's not quite, quite as powerful as our other bot is, um, but it does stuff. You get the video feed. Yeah, and there's the video feed of what everything, so if I wave. Tomorrow you'll be able to drive it and steer it instead yeah. of straight and back and forth. Cool, but we'll show off with the other one you guys will actually yeah. play with that. This one does completely independent. You can drive it around, do all that craziness yeah, with. with. the goggles, it's the best, so. Cool, thanks, guys. Any questions on that? The, the only part we didn't really cover is you probably should talk about just the Android Do We know how that works, because yeah. that is kind of the key to the whole thing. Yeah. It's really interesting part of the game. So uh, one of the biggest issues with ROS is that you need that, that, internet, communica uh, that internet communication. Um, most Arduinos, as I said, don't have that. So, is this still connected? Roz had built a couple years ago this package called uh, Roz Serial. And using Roz Serial, I needed to update pretty much everything. Um, but I eventually got this thing to work. And basically, what it does is there's this protocol. Let me see if I can. So this is the, the packet formula. Um, right here, this is, the, this is what everything, this is everything for, uh, for this protocol. Um, I needed to encode a byte packet to match that protocol, send that up, decode it on the other end, and say, OK, well, the Arduino encoded this message, this message, this message. I need to go publish this message, this message, this message. OK, the Arduino encoded that it needs uh, to register to this topic. It needs to publish to this topic. Um, and all of that information is sent over this byte stream uh, to the Android phone, which is, Andro or which is internet connected, and then is published through the Android phone. So it, it basically uses the Android phone or whatever other in internet connected device as a proxy um, for all of its communication with ROS. Uh, and that was very, very, uh, very tricky. Um, so. I'm not familiar with the term. Okay. Yep. And that's where it wasn't, they didn't have any of that before. And so that's where I was literally excited about the bit shifting, was actually make, basically writing that from scratch three years ago, trying to make all that work. Yep. Um, uh, under the hood, Roz is actually going to be updating to uh, DDS, so it's a like, enterprise grade middleware uh, for all the communications. It's the same stuff they use on the fly by wire for all the big chats and everything. So that's one of the other big changes that's coming down the pipe. But yeah, we'll still have to use that. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's how that worked. And that was the, the key for all of this. Without that, uh, nothing else happens because Arduino has to talk to Roz. And uh, without an internet connection, uh, which the Mega doesn't, there are some boards that you definitely can get an internet connection on. Uh, and we did play with some. Uh, the Yoon was one of them, wasn't it? Um, and there's a couple others. But uh, definitely, we wanted to make this platform available at the lowest common denominator, and that happens to be a non-internet connected well, device. And at the end of the day, I mean, the Android devices are getting so cheap. I mean, you get 
not I mean you get basically you, you get the brain but you, you get communication you get camera you get you get a screen mm -hmm. you get yeah and that everything. and that was another so that's thing that's the reason we really wanted to, to fix that bridge between that and the, uh, the other so rather oh. than like there's a shield like the Om includes uh, uh, like gyroscope and a bunch of other information, and those connect to the Arduino, um, and we'll give you information about what the Arduino is experiencing. Uh, all of those require a lot of extra code, more libraries, uh, more power consumption, a whole lot of stuff that gets tacked into your Arduino, which is already the uh, most limited aspect of your project. Um, when you're dealing with this, you already have everything that's already available to Android, and it's already there out of the box. You just have to tap into it. So it's no extra draw to get all of this information. It's just there. Cool. We have to wrap it. Cool. Uh, the only piece that I would say is there's a, uh, the special thing about the ADK board, if you pick them up, they have two USB connections. As soon as you plug in the phone, it detects it and launches your app, so everything is seamless. Once yeah. Really so... What's the battery like off the bot with the Harbor Freight? Tell <laughs> <laughs> uh, you. Yeah, so we'll know soon. And yeah, we, the plan is actually we're going to, this was a single uh, based on the power, what we're seeing on the power constraints. We, once we get those wired up, we'll probably do two of them. Serial, they're, they're 18 volt. And then the next one after that, I'll probably actually pay a little bit more, pay like 45 bucks and get the uh, lithium battery, which will be that uh, hell of a lot better. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right, I'm going to get this one set up. <laughs> Pizza, get more pizza. If you guys want to play with the robot stuff, you can see Ken. Otherwise, we gotta get Austin over here set up for his talk, and then roll the beer because we like roll the beer. At least I like roll the beer. All right. Roll the beer does like me because I give them big bar tabs. <laughs> <laughs> it's over here, dork. Oh, yeah? I know that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna find out. I know what it's doing if it's.
I'm not punching anybody. It doesn't sound like it's repeating me. All right. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. All right. Um, so last month at the, or no, it was this month, at the PHP meetup, I gave a talk on uh, designing mobile APIs. And so one of the things that I really got into was, you know, more so really good app side as well. Um, and particularly going back and forth with pretty much, you know, any app now is uh, going to have a network component to it. So um, what's the deal? So we have native ways, square ways, which um, pretty much there's an argument between three different libraries outside of the native way. Uh, Square is one of them, which Square being the company. Uh, Ion and Async. And um, basically you have three concepts to networking on Android. You have low level libraries, which are the way that is built into the actual SDK itself. You have mid-level libraries, which are just lightweight wrappers on top of what's already provided, just makes things a little cleaner. And then you have high-level libraries, which make everything super clean. Um, so we're going to talk about all three of these pretty quickly. Um, just a couple things. It's a good thing to learn to uh, use networking libraries. Pretty much any big app is going to use it. Uh, just for the fact that, and one of the things that we'll talk about, async tasks are really bad. Um, not very good networking in general. Um, Multi-thread, so in case you aren't aware, can't make a network call on the main thread on Android. Um, and the big thing is, we're not really going to talk about which one's best. You pick which one's best for the project, and there's a bunch of different evaluations as to which one you should determine that is. Also, it's really good for job applications. Um, pretty much anybody's going to ask if you have REST API experience, and it's a really good thing to be able to talk in depth about it and not just get calls, but also post and put and know the difference um, and delete as well. Um, in some cases, patch. It's a really good thing to know and it's a really good thing to have experience with. At the very least, I recommend like doing a Twitter app or something like that. It's really well documented um, and they're pretty easy to do. So let's look at the way that Google says to do it in their tutorial for developing applications. This might make your eyes bleed. It's really bad. Oh, man. Hey, look at that. All right. So, um, async task. This is the way that Google puts it in their documentations. The link's on here. Um, you can check it out. But basically, you start an async task, and it says, do in background. It says, try, download, and it says, return URL. So, it looks really short. And on a post execute, which runs on the UI thread, it sets a text view. Um, looks really short, but notice they're calling another method in there that's actually doing some of the work, which is all of this. So it's actually opening up a URL connection, setting all of its timeouts and everything, going all the way through, actually connecting, getting the response back, and then doing something with it. And if you notice, there's another method called read it where they're actually doing something with it. So then it comes in and there's another method for read it that's five lines and before you actually get something readable back from your connection. There's actually even more on top of that in the way that they do it. Um, and so one of the things about async calls is even if like, say they take a really long time, 
it's a big network request, or you're doing media or something like that, and the user exits the activity, your async task isn't done, more than likely you're probably going to leak uh, your activity, which is a really bad thing. Um, so what's better? So as far as mid-level libs, uh, pretty much every single mid library has a high library counterpart. So async Android and Ion, uh, OK HTTP, uh, which is Square. Um, there's is Retrofit. And then there's Volley, which is kind of in the middle. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about Volley tonight, um, mainly for the fact that most people will agree that it's somewhat outdated and they still do things very inefficiently. Um, so typically, most people are going to go with Ion or Retrofit. <coughs> so let's look at Android Async. And uh, that's the last bit of the github.com URL. So you can look at it. Um, it's based on Neo, which is uh, non-blocking IO. It's a uh, library that is actually in the Java framework. Uh, basically, what it is a long-running task without affecting any of the UI elements. Uh, futures, so futures are uh, similar to promises, as in they're going to come back. Also, very similar to observables when you're doing something like Rx Java. Um, one of the cool thing of things about futures is it's actually going to allow you to cancel the calls whenever your activity finishes, um, which is really important in keeping from leaking your activity. Um, another cool thing about Android Async is it has built-in web sockets and socket I.O. Um, so if you need a really good socket I.O. or web socket connection, uh, Android Async is probably the way that you want to go. There's a couple others out there. Um, I would argue that this is probably the most supported, um, and you're probably going to find a lot more documentation on it. Um, Built-in JSON file and caching. Um, so you can you know, do direct file URL requests, um, and it supports a, a couple other URIs as well, such as content. Um, and uh, URL caching, too. So if you have something that you're going to hit a lot, it can uh, help cache that for you. So this is a sample Git. And uh, you'll, know that it's, you'll notice that it just opens up a default instance. And it says, hey, I want to get this JSON object. It uses its own JSON object callback. And you'll notice one thing about this. This callback has all the exceptions in it, errors, and the result. So there's just a single uncompleted callback. It's up to you to determine whether or not that's actually going to be an error call or a success call. Um, and you'll notice that it just says, hey, I got a JSON object back. Uh, Ion is on top of async Android. Again, this is the high-level library that it uses. So uh, one thing about Ion um, that you'll notice it's different about Retrofit. Ion can actually handle media uh, pretty well. Um, Q and cancels. Again, I talked about the features. Uh, JSON and socket IO is not supposed to be there, is it? I think I made a mistake there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what it's supposed to be there. Uh, so JSON and Jackson, um, if you don't know the difference, uh, Jackson is slightly faster. JSON is way easier to use, in my opinion. Um, it uses annotations on regular POJOs, um, which makes it really easy to serialize back and forth. Uh, this is one thing that I really like about Ion uh, that you don't find in many libraries is it actually supports uh, the Charles proxy. If you haven't seen Charles or you don't know what it is, I highly recommend you check it out. It allows you to get a little bit more in depth with your network calls. Um, and see what's actually going forward and backwards a little bit better than you can in the debugger and ADB. So this is a sample ion get. And you'll notice it's just dot load URL, set a header. Um, and you notice your callback is actually going to a tweet object, a list of tweet objects. So there's no going through a, a standard JSON response and trying to figure out where everything goes. Um, there's a little black magic that happens where it just serializes it directly to the POJOs for you. Um, and again, same thing, only one callback uh, for uncompleted. Um, and it's up to you to figure that out. And you can see where they go through that list and add the tweets to their list adapter. 
So uh, Square and OKHTTP, these, this is where it starts to become a little bit different. Um, ION's a little bit heavier. So there's no media in OKHTTP. Um, there is RxJava support for um, reactive programming. There's actually going to be a really cool talk on that coming up uh, pretty soon. You can do a lot of uh, pretty interesting things with it. Particularly with network calls, you can chain them safely um, without having to worry about uh, starting calls and callbacks and then having nested references to your activities where you're going to leak them. And again, JSON and Jackson, that's definitely what's supposed to be on that other slide. Um, you can set which one you want to do. Uh, one cool thing about, oh, sorry. OK, HTTP, just for networking. There's nothing on top of it. So there's no media, nothing special. Um, Square actually has a, a separate networking image library called Picasso um, that does caching and everything like ION does. So there's disk caching and memory caching um, as well. So just a sample uh, JSON get with uh, OK, HTTP, create the client. You create the request, and you just make a new call with request execute, and the body comes back uh, through the response. Again, you have to figure out whether or not it was successful, anything like that. But this just sits on top of the regular Android protocols and wraps it and makes it a lot shorter for you. Retrofit sits on top of um, OKHTTP, and it's a really REST structured library. Um, and you'll see this whenever we look at the request. Everything is Java annotations, so everything is you know at get, at post, at put, at delete. Um, again, it supports RxJava as well, uh, JSON and Jackson. And one thing that's cool is Retrofit is highly customizable uh, within certain limits. Not customizable on what you're getting back from calls per se, if you use the standard serialization. But you can write your own converters. So if you have something that's coming back in like a YAML file, file or something like that, you can write your own converter and let that um, go through. Also, you can put uh, your own request interceptors and different stuff like that in there to where you can add headers to calls automatically or determine whether or not you should um, pretty easily. And of course, since it's a Square product, it sets up with Dagger really well. Uh, for dependency injection. So this is a sample retrofit service. So I have a git and a post. Um, put and patch are the same as a post, and delete is the same as a git. So you'll notice like there's a body um, that I have as a pojo. And um, you'll notice in the git callback, it just says you know it's a list person. Uh, sample retrofit git. So you'll notice this is one of the big differences between retrofit and ion where the user API service, when they call get current user, it just has a callback for the user and it has a success or a failure. So I can explicitly know within my code what I'm doing on success and what I'm doing on failure as opposed to having to manually go in and make sure that I'm checking the failure every single time. So just to recap, native ways, they're pretty bad. Square ways and ION and async. Um, Lower level libraries, typically you won't need them unless you're doing something that's highly specific. Uh, if you're dealing with a good structured REST API, there's no reason why you can't use a high level library. Uh, Mid-level libraries are only used um, in weird cases where your high level library won't really support it. Like retrofit, for example, doesn't cancel calls very well. So you actually back down to OKHTTP OK where you can cancel them uh, pretty frequently and pretty easily. So I tried to make this quick um, since we're normally at WAB by now, but uh, that's all I got. So. Any questions? Slide again. Dang, you were ready to answer stuff too. Yeah, sorry, buddy. <laughs> I'll make you do it again. All yeah. right. By the way, haha, as you can tell, fixed it. I'm not trolling myself anymore. Did you figure out that it was your HDMI going through your projector? Yes. Thought about that on the way over here? Yeah. yeah. So, all right. You know those tickets? You might want to get those out.
How's my JavaScript app? Um, it's on a private repo. <laughs> I will open source it, don't worry. I had McLean put it on the cloud space. It's on a private repo, though. So. We'll code review for you, don't worry. Here we go again. All right. Like I said, the first one gets to either pick the book, which I've given this one out before, my shirt, not this exact shirt, but a shirt, and then the bags. So who's 618? Come on. Woo! What do you want, Ryan? The book. Cat. I have like 20 of those bags. <laughs> when you come here in F, we have a ton of them, and I'm still going to give them away. And I actually got a picture from one of our guys who does um, stuff with um, Tech Rangers. One of our buddies, uh, Keegan's brother, has like six sunglasses on in one picture. It's amazing. <laughs> His name's Zach. Yes, Zach. I was trying to play nice and not like call him out. <laughs> oh, he loves it. He's trying to collect more, so if you don't want them, I'll take them to give them. So then I should just tweet the picture then. Oh, yeah. Okay, because it's him wearing like six pairs of sunglasses. Okay, I'll do it. Because, I mean, we already have Austin over here who wears them as a headband. <laughs> I did. Well, it's okay. classy, yeah. And in your Slack picture, you're yeah. wearing them. <laughs> well, Orlando Tech now has a few of them too. There's like a big box. Well, shit. Who's 619? You want the bag or a t shirt? You want the t shirt? What size are you? Huh? What size do you want? Excel. Extra large? Can you grab me extra large? Okay. Thank you. He's going to grab it for you, so you can say it. Yeah. All right. Damn. Ed doesn't like all you people. 615. Oh. Thing's broken. Yeah, I was about to say. This thing's very well. No. I'm scared. Well, technically, Mike wasn't allowed to use it. What did he do to me? It's clearly very random. <laughs> I know, I was like, come on, guys, seriously. It's not like my JavaScript. 621. Jose. Oh. That doesn't count. <laughs> yeah? He wasn't here with the meetup started, so he doesn't get anything. <laughs> you have to wear him if he was. No, he already gave him away. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Dang, I should have gotten, I should have made sure all of you guys had cloud space sunglasses so I get a picture while you guys. Like, Girls are out. <laughs>